The Parkinson's Podcast is brought to you by the Davis Finney Foundation and brings you the stories, wisdom, and expertise of people living with Parkinson's, care partners, and Parkinson's professionals. Additionally, we would like to thank our title podcast sponsor, AbbVie, for helping us bring this content to you. AbbVie is committed to recognizing the uniqueness and needs of each person living with Parkinson's and delivering innovative solutions for patients, care partners, and clinicians. In this episode, panelists discuss fear and Parkinson's. They talk about kids, relationships, progression, falling, loss of identity, cognition, and more. This is part one of their discussion. My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education and Content at the Davis Finney Foundation. And I am here with our fabulous Living with Parkinson's meetup. We have Kat and Kevin and Christy and Doug and Robin and Sri and Brian, and they're all going to introduce themselves. Let's do a fun question. Um, okay, your name, where you're calling in from, um, how long you've been living with Parkinson's, and the best thing that's happened to you in the last six months, the most memorable thing that's happened to you in the last six months. Okay, Kat, you're going first. Okay. I am Kat Hill. Um, I am calling in from outside of London, England. Uh, probably the most exciting thing that's happened to me in the last six months is um coming overseas, flying overseas a little over a week ago. And uh, let's see, I've been living with Parkinson's for probably, uh, you know, in retrospect, probably 15, 16 years. I was diagnosed though in 2015. Did I get it? That's perfect. Thank you. Kevin. Hi everyone. Uh, Kevin Kwok uh, dialing in from Boulder. Uh, 14 years celebrating a wonderful 14 year diagnosis <laughs> with Parkinson's. Um, something great in the last six months. Um, on a personal physical note, I actually feel like I'm getting better in the sport uh, that I've been spending a lot of time this winter on, and that's downhill skiing. <laughs> So it's something that just uh, for, for me personally uh, has, been person real, has been a real. Sorry, sorry. Getting an echo. Mel, you need Mal, to you mute, need to mute Amber. Amber. Oh, sorry. Oh. There you go. There you go. Someone else has, Someone got, else the has got the echo. Just turn, yeah, maybe turn, we can, yeah, maybe we can ourselves, ourselves off, ourselves if, you're off if you're not talking. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, downhill skiing, it's still possible to learn and do amazing things, even after you've been living with Parkinson's for 14 years. Um, I'm going to pull this one out because this was pretty exciting. Somebody just said that she found out her daughter, where did it go? Somebody found out their daughter was having twins. Now I lost it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Christy, your turn. Man, I don't know how I'm going to follow up after Kevin and his <laughs> positivity. I mean, come on. So, hi, I'm Christy. I'm calling in from Troy, New York. And um, I was diagnosed in 2020, but I've really been having symptoms back to 2015 and REM sleep disorder back to like graduate school. Um, something that's exciting that has happened in the six months, past six months, I, um, I think a lot of the projects I'm working on are really exciting and I can't wait to see them be released at the WPC, particularly our book on, um, young onset women, um, and everything that we wish that we knew when we were diagnosed and also the PMD Alliance global support group, a guide that I've been working on. I'm really excited about that awesome. as well. Love it. Yeah. Thank you, Doug, and then Robin. Hi, everyone. Doug Reed, zooming in from Lafayette, Colorado. I was diagnosed in 2010 uh, when I was 36. I'd been experiencing symptoms for at least a couple of years prior, a small 
pill rolling tremor in my hand. I had DBS three and a half years ago. And the most memorable thing that's happened to me in the past six months was I broke my leg downhill skiing on March 31st. And I'm still in a boot, still uh, on a knee scooter and crutches, non weight bearing until mid June. But I'm optimistic I'm going to be good to go for the World Parkinson's Congress. Great. Awesome. So, cautionary tale, but not really, because you're probably going to be back skiing too. Like, you <laughs> yeah. love it. Right. Um, okay. Robin and then Sri. Sure. Robin Moravis calling in from Charlotte, North Carolina. I was diagnosed in 2015 at the age of 46, but when I understood the full constellation of symptoms, I'm going back to 2003, 2004 in my early 30s. And the most memorable thing for me, um, it's not a fun and exciting thing, but um, I spent over a month with my mother helping get her transitioned into assisted living. And um, she got diagnosed with Parkinson's a few years after I did. But in a way, it's kind of, she's ended up in a beautiful, gorgeous place, not a nursing home, assisted living. They go out and do all kinds of fun things. And But it's kind of restored my faith in life a little bit. I don't know how to explain it, but. Oh, I love that. That, because that's not often you know, the experience of a lot of people when they parents transition to something else. So that's great. Sri and then Brian. So, hey, I'm Sri from the San Francisco Bay Area. I've been diagnosed for seven years, had physical symptoms three years prior to that, two and a half to three years prior and prodronal. I have so much trouble pronouncing this word now. Prodronal? Yeah. Symptoms about 20 years prior, well, 15 years prior to diagnosis. And the most exciting thing that's happened to me recently is I actually got to meet a photographer who I follow on Instagram, whose sports photography I love. And it was the most exciting thing that has happened actually maybe in more than this year, maybe last year too. It's kind of so cool to meet somebody that you really admire and respect and love their artwork. And then you meet them like, just by like, whoa, it was so cool. Yeah. Awesome. Love that. Brian and then Amber. You're, you're muted, Brian. Okay. Got me? Yep. So I'm calling from the Huntington Beach area uh, in Southern California. Uh, I was diagnosed uh, 13 years ago. Um, and uh, the probably the most exciting thing that's happened in the last six months for me was when my application to teach laughter yoga at a renewal room at WPC 2023 got accepted. Um, that's just so exciting and it's great because it's on the 10 year anniversary of when I learned it at WPC 2013 in Montreal, so. Very exciting, thanks yeah. Brian. All right, Amber, um, let's give this a try. Can you hear me? Yeah, Yay. yeah. Yay, sorry, I had technical difficulties. Um, I am not sure the questions that were being asked, but from what I gather, I'm Amber. I was diagnosed. I'm calling from El Paso, Texas. I was diagnosed in 2018 with Parkinson's when I was 35. Had DBS um, in 2020 or 2021. I don't know. It's all a blur. Um, and the most exciting thing that's happened to me in the last six months, um, I got a grant to attend the World Parkinson's Congress. So I'm so excited to meet some of you in person finally. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Oh, Amber. Can oh, Amber. Can I think it's like when Amber's thing, I, I get all, um, I'll, I'll turn myself off, but I do want to say Dave. Oh, hi everyone. I'm Dave iron Ore, which is the best name maybe I've ever heard from San Antonio, Texas. I retired some time ago, one and a half years ago, and it's going well found out about two years ago. Thanks for sharing Dave. Um, okay. Uh, today we are going to be talking about fear. Uh, we're sort of doing a two part. We're doing fear and shame uh, over this session and then June session. And uh, this session, Robin has uh, raised her hand to facilitate and guide everybody through the discussion. And next uh, month through shame, we're going to have Heather do it. Uh, so hope that you guys are in for, for the ride and uh, ready to, to talk about it. Thanks, uh, Robin. Go for it. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Um, 
So we were talking about fear and shame as a potential topic, and we just figured that there's so much material here that we wanted to bifurcate it into a two-month topic. And there are different kinds of fears. There are just kind of the catastrophic fear-based thing that don't have any kind of connection to reality. Then there's fears that are grounded in more real life experience. So we all have a whole range of fears. And I won't speak for everyone on the panel, but I know that my fears have changed as my diagnosis has progressed and time has passed. And um, so I've got some questions. I've asked the panelists to think about some different stages and things that they experienced along the way. And so what I wanted to start with for everyone is uh, we're just going to kind of go round robin with this and you can elaborate as much as you want. Um, so we're first talking about giving one example of a fear that you had either at diagnosis or very early on that did not come to pass or has not yet come to pass. And so I'm going to start with Kat. I'm going to go sort of zigzag on my screen. I'm going to start with Kat. Okay, thanks, Robin. Um, I think one of my biggest fears was very practical. Um, early on, uh, I was really worried about money and leaving my practice as a nurse midwife, a nurse practitioner. Um, and I was worried that I, it would mean giving up on all of our retirement dreams. And um, I think that 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 is, I'm very happy to say that that has not come to pass in the last 10 years. We may be doing it a little differently and a little more creatively, but we are still um, traveling and um, we're overseas right now. We're, we're, um, uh, we're very happy. We're still married and we are not bankrupt. So that was, that was a very early fear for me. So and you're living in an airstream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, right now I'm living in a hotel room, but but yes, this year I'm I, we've been traveling the country in the airstream. So yeah, but we're not going to live in an airstream forever. I just want you know, don't worry, folks. I'm not coming to a driveway near you. So <laughs> okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah. Um... Uh, similar to to Kat, um, the fear that I had most was, was being marginalized after I, I admitted to the world that I had this ailment and feeling like I would be left behind by colleagues and by um by by friends. And in fact, some of this did happen. There was a shift. And, and there was a change in people that I used to think were really close friends through work and professionally. I, I lost touch with a lot of them. Uh, but I think what became really exciting for me is this backfill of new relationships. Uh, and so I survived, you know, and, and the testimony is this panel. The, the, the panel members are that are all on your screen now are all very dear friends. Uh, and I would not have had that experience had I not been uh, diagnosed and left my past life. Thanks. Doug. And now for the panelists, I do want to remind you, sorry to, to cut you off. We are going to talk about an example of a fear that you had that did come to pass. Right now, it's, we want to talk about ones that didn't come to pass or haven't yet. Uh, when I was initially diagnosed, I was really concerned about being alone. Um, I was married at the time, but my marriage fell, fell apart shortly thereafter. And I have found out that my friends and my family are closer than ever. Um, I get lonely at times, but... I've got new friends, panelists here, people from the foundation, um, and the fear hasn't happened, thankfully. Thank you. Christy. Uh, 
I mm. think that when I was just I, when I was diagnosed, my biggest fear was that of the unknown. Like I didn't know how fast everything was going to go, how slow it was going to go, what was going to happen with work, um, and that was going to have crippling anxiety forever. Because when I was diagnosed, I just I was taking so much Xanax a day because I was just crippled by anxiety. But that all kind of went away for the anxiety and just moved on to different things and different worries. It's interesting as people are talking already, I'm sort of noticing that we're going to have some overlap in the categories of, you know, it's just interesting. It'll make for a pretty robust discussion. <laughs> uh, Shri. So I actually don't remember being scared of anything. That's not to say that I wasn't. I just don't remember. And I think part of the reason if I truly wasn't is that I didn't know anything about Parkinson's when I was diagnosed. I didn't have an image in my mind of what anybody looked like. I That old white man model that people talk about, I had no knowledge of that. I met, I had a family friend who was diagnosed. And when I met him, he seemed basically okay, right? When he, and he'd been living with the disease at that time for eight years. He's not doing so well now. But I had never met anyone with Parkinson's before, nothing. So it was like a blank slate for me. So the one small concern I had was that I, what would I do about work? But I wasn't presenting very actively then. So yeah, I, I think coming from a no fear place was really great for me because I didn't have anything to worry about. When you come to the next question, <laughs> then I'll have more to say, but yeah, uh, not, not, nothing for me, honestly. Thank you, Brian. I'm kind of in the same boat as Suri. I, I didn't necessarily look at it. My life was in such a positive place. I didn't look at things as fear. I think maybe the only thing I did fear was um, possibly ending up like my uncle who had Parkinson's uh, and he wasn't very mobile and uh, all his kids had to assist him when we'd go to the beach and stuff. Um, and just ending up like that old man picture that Sri mentioned. But, you know, those were really kind of far back in my mind because I was focused on the here and now more. Thanks. Amber. Um, I think my fear has and always will be how it will impact my kids. Um, when I was diagnosed, they were seven and nine. Uh, they are 12 and 14 now. And so this is a trick question um, because some ways it has already impacted them and in the long term, I really don't know where it's going to leave them, what their level of involvement will have to be. And that's scary. And of course, you know, how long can I work to provide for them? I'm a single mom. Will I ever meet somebody who's willing to take on this burden with me? Um, it's the fears are endless, but all really surrounding the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Amber, you've got to Amber, mute yourself. Amber, you've got to mute yourself. There we go. There we go. Nope. Nope. All right, there we go. All right, go. there we go. Nope. 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 <laughs> um, I was a little bit like Christy. It wasn't that I had perpetual anxiety about the unknown, but I started learning about all the symptoms. And every time I had a new symptom presentation, I would freak out. And I would think that every single thing that was happening was the beginning of the end, but then it would only last two or three weeks and it would go away. <laughs> and so, and a, the only thing that has been really consistent has been my tremor. And some things, you know, were there for three weeks, never to return again. Sometimes they pop up for three weeks, once a year, but I don't freak out nearly as much anymore um, because I know that for me, the way that my Parkinson's presents, it's a little bit more like whack-a-mole and it just, you know, things kind of pop up and then they go back down and then they stop. So, um, but I was, I was just convinced that it was the beginning of the end. And I mean, I had real doomsday fears that I think with just some time living with the disease, we all learn the cycles of our body, the cycles of the seasons, the cycles of our disease, and sort of the the rate of our progression, so to speak. 
Okay. Also, for those of you who are, want to in the chat, you know, feel free to throw yours in there. Uh, some of your things, we'll, we'll get to talk about all of those as well. Yep, Mel, feel free to chime in. I can't multitask to that level. <laughs> um, so now we're going to talk about an example of a fear that you had at any point in the journey, not at diagnosis, but that did indeed come to pass. And I'm interested for people to elaborate a little bit about how did you handle it? How did you get through it? Or did it unfold differently than you expected? I felt like some people already shared on some things that they had fears and yet things unfolded a little bit differently than they maybe feared that they would. Like Doug, when you were talking about, you know, the dissolution of your marriage and yet you have all these other support people that come in. So I'm going to go in the same order before we just sort of wide open, open it up for discussion. So Kat, you're up. All right. Um, I, I think it, it was difficult for me. I felt better once I separated from work, once I figured out what was going on and once I was able to rest. And so I, I think having some regular sleep and a, a regular rhythm um, helped me early on to manage my symptoms better once I kind of figured out what was going on. Um, and I think I got a little cocky thinking, oh, I, you know, I've got this, this, I feel better, you know, I'm kind of posting along and maybe I really don't have Parkinson's. Yes, the tremors there and yes, this and that. Um, and, and I think, um, you get, I got lulled a little bit into a sense of maybe I'll be an outlier and a really slow progressor. And, it, you know, and that, <laughs> the self-talk and the denial, I think it is um, a real part of who I am and it's partly how I stay positive, but I don't, it, it, it did, pro it has progressed. It has impacted me more. The symptoms um, are progressing uh, at probably a fairly normal rate. I'm not some great outlier. Yes, they were right with the diagnosis. So um, I, I don't know if that really answers the question. I, I will say too that my dad had Parkinson's and it, my Parkinson's has been very different than his journey. He was diagnosed much later in life mm -hmm. um, and his he didn't have any tremor and his progressed um, uh, uh, cognitively, I'm a little sleep deprived, so don't take that as cognitive, but it cognitively really differently. So, um, certainly my cognition and my, um, multitasking ability has kind of gone away, but, um, anyway, did I answer the question? Well, it's good, good fodder Order. for discussion. Okay. I mean, and feel free as we go through, if you want to comment on anything that anybody else has said, one of the things that it struck me is that um, there's a really beautiful book called When Breath Becomes Air. I don't know if anybody's read it. And he talks about sort of the acceptance paradigm in reverse and accepting the disease. And, and I feel like that that's really applicable for me in that to really function well in my job and in my life, I pretty much have to be in denial. You know, it just, I mean, I don't know if I'm in acceptance or denial, either one, it works fine. <laughs> Kevin. Yeah, for, for me, my biggest fear was progression of the disease in general. You know, um, like Kat, in the early days of my disease, in the journey, I thought I'd beaten this thing. I was exercising, I was doing things like crazy. And it was like those people that I've gone to and who I've seen that have advanced, that's not going to be me, right? I think I've come to, I definitely have advanced. Just in the last two to three years, my voice is worse my ability to cognitively handle multiple things is not where it used to be. Uh, but I guess I'm taking a lesson now from people like Davis and people like Michael J. Fox, uh, who, who, are, who say it's okay to progress, right? 
Uh, so um, for those of you who haven't seen his, his documentary yet, still is really a must-see documentary. It really gets into this, it's okay. You know, the disease that we have, we're not going to be cheerleaders about it uh, and say it's not a bad thing. But, but we can still remain optimistic and live a, as things happen to us. So that's more my general gestalt over how I handle uh, a disease that will, will eventually advance. Mm -hmm. It's a limited release on Apple TV, that movie still. And uh, we watched it over the weekend. I don't even know if it's still up because I think it was very limited. I think it was like a week or two weeks. Christy, you seem to know. You're on mute. It should still be up. So that you can, if you purchase Apple TV, so you, if you have if you have Roku, you can get Apple TV for free. So it's, you get free for three months so that you can watch it as many times as you want. Mm. Thank you. Doug. Uh, I was very concerned about the side effects of medications and specifically dyskinesias from carbidopa levodopa. And probably at about seven years post-diagnosis, I was very dyskinetic. And when I would talk, it would get worse. And so I found myself isolating. And it was... It was debilitating, but I was taking so much carbidopa levodopa and wasn't really managing my medications well in terms of timing and dosing. And eventually I'd watched a Davis Finney webinar on DBS and decided to take the leap and have since weaned myself off carbidopa levodopa completely. And I don't take many Parkinson's medications. I just take two selegiline a day, but my dyskinesias have gone away, thankfully. Does the um, selegiline help with non-motor symptoms like rigidity or stiffness or things like that? I think it helps with all motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms. Mm. Uh, it's it, my nurse, my movement disorder specialist described it as activating, which I take as energizing. It, it, somehow it gives me energy and calms my tremors and it it helps. That's one of the things that since I had DBS in 2020, I haven't been on any PD meds since 2020, but I'm having some like dystonia in my feet and um, in my back. And, you know, I wrote a little note, things to talk about with my movement disorder specialist who I see next month. So I don't know what kind of medication options there are, but that's a conversation for another time. I'd recommend trying Azelect or Selegiline. We'll talk about it. Thank you. Christy. So I have two, two things. So one of my fears that's ongoing is that I feel like I wonder if I'm progressing fast. I'm not sure because when I'm on, I'm, I'm on, like really on but then I can go off, but then I can come back on. So it's probably, I'm probably catastrophizing everything, but I just <laughs> worry, worry. And I'm, I'm, I fear that it's just fast progression, but probably, I, I don't know, I need to talk to my movement disorder specialist, but that's a constant bear. And then another one is, um, this is a little bit more personal. So I'm just going to share with, everyone in the world. So I feel like I missed out on a lot. So I went to, for my undergrad, then I did my master's, and then my PhD. Then after my PhD, then I did my postdoc, and then I got my tenure track physician. So I was waiting to get tenure to have children, and I got tenure and Parkinson's. Mm. So that having kids for me is not, is not a thing. It's not going to happen just because when I go off my meds, I'm really rigid and stiff. So it's, it's walking, moving is difficult. So it's just not conducive to raising a family. So, sorry, that's my fear. 
that's okay. And, you know, there's a lot of crossover of the fear with grief and sadness or shame. You know, we're going to talk about that next month. Um, but it does knock you for a loop. Uh, you know, like Kat, you were talking about your retirement looks different. You're having a retirement, but it looks different. And, you know, Doug, I'm in the same boat with you. My marriage dissolved over my diagnosis. So thanks for sharing that with us, Christy. Shri. Oh, my. How do I follow up from that? Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say, jokingly say my biggest fear was that the Golden State Warriors would not beat the Lakers. And that has definitely come to pass. They did mm -hmm. not beat the Lakers. But go Dobbs, my sweatshirt is on. Um, <laughs> but I, I worried, I think when I meet people with Parkinson's, I see what symptoms they have. And when they mention how they're progressing, I worry that, oh, my gosh, that's going to happen to me. One of those issues was swallowing and uh, not being able to speak as well. And similar to Kat, I actually lived in, I, I didn't even know you felt that way, Kat. So that's really kind of refreshing to hear because I thought I'm the only one who lived in glitter denial land. I'm like, wow, I'm not exercising and I haven't done any exercise in two years and I don't seem to be progressing at all. So I'm that magical, special person that the Parkinson's fairies have chosen to just bless. And then you wake up and you realize, oh my gosh, I have progressed. And what world was I living in? Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was swallowing and uh, not being able to speak as clearly, which was something that really bought, worried worried me. And then it happened. And it's not been easy. Um, I have to be careful now about what I eat, you know, like chips, no eating while I'm driving, eating in smaller bites, chewing more, which maybe is why I've lost so much weight because I'm chewing a lot more. So burning calories, yay. Good for that. Um, so that's come to pass. The other one is, I think Doug mentioned dyskinesia. I had met a beautiful, amazing uh, person with Parkinson's who had a very severe dyskinesia. And I thought, I hope that never happens to me. I definitely don't want that to happen. And over the past year, that's definitely happened to me. Even on the smallest dose, I get very dyskinetic. It's extremely uncomfortable. And I also feel like I need to hide in public and, you know, like kind of contort my body into stillness. And I think people don't recognize or realize that I'm dyskinetic. I'm like, oh, nobody's saying anything. So clearly I just believe I'm dyskinetic. Nobody else believes I am. And then I'll look at a video or I'll see like something a friend posted or somebody will come up to me or my mom will say, why does your head move that way? Like wh wh what's going on with your body? And so it's been, it's been painful. It's been painful. But at the same time, these levels of acceptance come slowly and I try not to fight it. I try to just accept it. And I don't want to say embrace it, but when I fight it, it doesn't help me mentally, physically. I just feel worse. So the acceptance for me is what really is helping, I think. We'll see how it goes. And to get to acceptance, there's sort of a process of surrender to reality as it is unfolding. <laughs> and a lot of sugar and chocolate. There you and go. Grief. And I think there's grief. And I think... Um, for for those things that we wanted that we may not have um and uh that i think that's real and i think in order to get to acceptance we have to grieve mm -hmm. you know whatever that means to you you know yeah, yeah. at some point i want to cry but i haven't cried since i got first diagnosed so eventually those tears are going to have to come i think i don't think i've let myself properly grieve but that's a good point you know, it's really weird because I haven't really cried over my diagnosis until I watched the movie still. I cried my eyes out at the end of that movie. I don't, you know, just, it was like, I don't even know why, but just all of it, all the grief from diagnosis to present day. Brian, what you got for us? <laughs> well, just to, first I want to interject as I'm listening to, to all of you, I, I'm getting this greater awareness by understanding, listening to this committee over the, the many months uh, about women's issues with PD. And, and I love how Kat and Sri and others are really bringing this to the forefront and having Christy share what she shared, I thought it was very bold. And it's also really significant part of women with PD. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm just very uh, proud of her sharing such a, a difficult thing. 
Um, and mine, I was like, Kat, I was in, I was swimming in, I used to tease people that I was swimming in denial and it's not the river in Egypt. Uh, it, it was truly something I didn't want to embrace was Parkinson's. So I was a high school teacher. I taught photography and video production at the same time. I had a TV studio. I had kids doing photo projects, community projects. I also worked in summers at Adobe and would get trained in products and go around the country and teach other teachers. And so I didn't want any of that impacted by Parkinson's. Uh, and I was in huge denial as to how it was impacting. Uh, and it was about four years into it that one night I came home and I just could not move. I was absolutely frozen and lying in bed. And my wife came to my bedside and just started crying and said, this is just so hard to see you like this. Uh, and that's when I realized, okay, <laughs> you know, I, I had seen it coming because I, I never had a student aid before. And I had six of them for seven periods of teaching. Uh, and um, I went and gave my notice the next day, but that my fear was that I was going to lose my job. And I did. Uh, but it turned out to be a blessing because the next year, Lily was diagnosed with cancer and I was able to be there for her full time, which I couldn't have been otherwise. So, and and then that went on for five years. So, um, so I don't look at it as a curse. It was just, it was a hard transition. Uh, so it got realized, but I think as we hear from everybody, better things came down the pipe. You know, Lily and I had an amazing five years together uh, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So. And I think that right. this panel does a good job of focusing on the positive, the silver linings, the unexpected blessings, the living your best life now, because there are a lot of that too. So, but I just like to hear how people, I'm seeing some really good comments too in the chat, Mel, if you want to take a moment, but, um, you know, it's neat to hear how people process their fear and are moving through it. But Mel, you were going to read some of the chats. Yeah, um, Sam has, has um, provided a bunch of tips for people who have said several things. And Brian, I wonder if you um, could, and, and some of you, I mean, I think a lot of you can speak to this, but a couple of people talked about how in the world you deal with this alone uh, when you're alone. And Brian, somebody in particular, um, their fear, they said their fear is that they will outlive their partner and they think there's no way they can handle it. And I feel like you would be a really good person to, to talk about this. Um, certainly you don't have to just tell a long story, but, um, you know, just, I'm sure you never imagined that would be, this would be your situation either, but, um, you're doing it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And I'll try to keep it really brief, but it's interesting when, when I was first diagnosed, the doctor said, uh, you know, you've got Parkinson's and, uh, you basically get your affairs together. Your wife's going to be your caregiver for the rest of your life. And Lily walked out of the room and said, I'm not going to be your caregiver. I'm your care partner. <laughs> uh, we're in this together. And, we really, I think that was the beautiful part of it. So when she was gone, it's like, what the hell? Uh, you know, when she was in hospice, it was so beautiful every single day. And we just saw so many blessings. I didn't prepare myself. You can't. Um, I think it, it's been a hard road. And I went through a really rough depression from her dying for about six months. Then I found the road that I wanted to be on. And I turned my garage into a physical therapy space. And I lost 80 pounds and I just got back into shape. And, and then other consequences happened in life that kind of brought me back down to different things. Uh, but what I've learned each knockdown that I get is basically this community, this Parkinson's community is unlike any. You meet people with Parkinson's and it's like all the pretenses come down and people are genuine and they're heartfelt and they're real and they're help is genuine and you know the foundations uh you know the davis finney foundation the fox um gosh i can't think of one that isn't good they're all just great and um i think that's what holds it together for me so it's hard uh like doug said you know there's times where it's lonely uh but i'd rather be alone than with the wrong person and have the wrong things um so i think the thing that keeps me going is is finding things that i love to do like the laughter yoga uh, and, and there's really someday I'll have to get around to showing that strong ties to how it benefits Parkinson's immensely. Um, but doing that and, um, finding other ways to, to make a difference for people and make a difference for cancer. 
uh, those are the things that keep me going. So it's Thanks, I have a full schedule every day. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Okay, we're gonna circle back up to Amber. Don't wanna skip her. I feel real boring because ultimately it's still the kids. Um, you know, really what how it's gonna impact them. My grandma has Alzheimer's. So every time I forget something, I worry about that eventually developing for me and what that's going to do to them, how they're going to manage that. Uh, the other day, my kids found my paperwork for uh, the testing that I have to do because I have swallowing issues, like Sri was talking about. I choke, except it's not on food. It's always on my own saliva. And so they found that. And I think that freaked them out a little bit. They were like, you never told us that you have problems swallowing. What are you talking about? And I'm like, it happens like daily. And now they're hyper aware of it. And so mm. I worry about what that does to them emotionally, psychologically. Um, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, but it's them. They will always be my biggest fear. And I think that's true for any mom or any parent, um, no matter what, even if you don't have, sorry, even if you don't have Parkinson's, I think your kids are always your biggest worry. Amber, I don't want you to be sorry. <laughs> I appreciate how honest you are. Hey, you know. I saw the posting of your son singing La Bamba the other day on Facebook. I, 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 I was in tears. I love that. Oh, you and me both. <laughs> You've raised good children. And, and just... There we go. Amber, I'll email you after to... Um... Are your kids getting any counseling? No, they're not. Um, they're much like their mother and they handle it with humor. I honestly don't know why I worry so much because they are resilient and they make jokes about it. And my oldest son has been like, so when you get really bad, are you gonna come and live with me? Like in my van down by the river? Um, so I really don't know why I have so much worry because they seem to be handling it well. It's just, I'm their mom. So ultimately that's my job. So thank you. I, um, so my turn giving examples of fear that I had, um, and how did I handle it? I, this is circling more back to Kevin's fear originally. My fear was I didn't want anyone to know unless I told them. I didn't want to be stigmatized. I didn't want it to be. I didn't want to be marginalized, and I wanted to control the narrative of how people found out. I was especially concerned of, for my job. I didn't want my employer to know, and little did I know, my husband my ex-husband was telling absolutely everybody, even though he told me he wouldn't. And um, little did I know, everybody knew, and I didn't know that they knew. Uh, even strangers, we, we owned a business, a, a retail storefront type of business, and had a lot of clients. And, you know, it was just, uh, it was a little bit, I was shocked. I did feel initially demoralized by it, but like so many of my particular fears, nothing came of it. It was no big deal that everybody knew, and it was only a big deal to me. But that one, that topic was very interwoven with my shame. That fear was very tied to shame about how I'm perceived by the outside world. Um, I had more fears about that than I did about progression of the disease. So moving on, what's a fear that you have today? Amber, we know the kids. <laughs> uh, what's a fear that you have today? And based on your personal experience so far, do you think it's a legitimate fear? Why or why not? And how do you handle fears that crop up today? 
Kat. I'm going to unmute. It was very sweet. Joe just said on the, on the chat, uh, he's never seen me look so sad or so tired. I was feeling very moved by Amber's story. <laughs> so I've got tears and I'm traveling. So it's late in the day and I'm always, uh, I'm tired late in the day. So anyway, I wanted to thank you for your concern. <laughs> um, and Robin, tell me the question again. I got sidelined here. No, sure. Uh, a fear that you have today, and based on your experience so far, do you mm -hmm. think it's kind of a legitimate fear based in reality? Why or why not? And how do you handle fears that crop up today? I just, so, and anyone who wants to speak to like the evolution of your fears. Yeah, I will, I will say today, today's a really good day to ask. It was a travel day for us. And so we were on plane, well, not planes, but trains, multiple trains, train stations in very busy places. And it, those are really hard for me to navigate. And um, I get very symptomatic and I get very fearful about um losing my way. I have like this teapot feeling like I'm constantly at a simmer. And, and if things, uh, and it's not based really in reality, I know that I can always ask for help or, um, and I'm traveling with my husband who helps me navigate, but it is getting harder to do that. It's getting harder to travel. Um, it's taking more energy and more recovery time. And so I think that those are, are things that I need to be more aware of in my planning. I'm not going to give up travel, um, not today. Um, but But I think as things progress, I need to accept that that's part of it and so plan differently. So I hope I answered that. Yeah, my partner and I have, we've made an agreement that we realize it's not just the two of us traveling, there's three of us, <laughs> us and my Parkinson's, and we need to take all three into account when we're making our travel plans. Well, and I, okay. I had to cancel travel today. I was supposed to go to Boulder, uh, but I had some physical issues that are making it more difficult. So mm. you got to flow with it. Kevin, what you got? Oh, well, first of all, Brian, I'm sorry. I was hoping to see you here in Boulder, yeah. brother. Uh, we'll find a way to catch up. We will. Um, but um, Sophia, one of the things that started materializing for me is I used to like to sort of dominate conversation. Uh, I was very much the type A and would always, you know, have the funny anecdote or could finish the conversation. Um, I'm noticing now that the slowness and the paucity of my conversation and thinking Plus the, the 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 mechanics of getting words out without sounding like I've got a mouthful of marbles is is starting to make me become more withdrawn. And so I, you know, if I'm in a loud restaurant, I'll just sit back and not even talk. Uh, and to me, um, maybe that's a good thing, right? Maybe, Maybe my ex-wife is happy now that I'm not talking so much all the time. Um, but it's something that I'm noticing and it's progressing. It's one of those things where just communicating is becoming a daily challenge. And for a guy who communicated for a living, it, it's shocking to my system. I think for a lot of us, those symptoms are the most shocking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kevin, yeah. do you find you're being a better listener? What was that? <laughs> are you finding? I mean, I am. Are, are you finding you're being smart, Alec? Okay, I didn't even get it. I get it now. <laughs> no, I definitely am. I, I find that... Um, 
actually by listening, I'm actually hearing and learning a lot more. Yeah, it's interesting too. I have that too, but I just, I'm comfortable just, I don't need to be the center of attention. I don't need to be the showstopper. I could just listen. I think it's really important too for those of us who come from more of a performative perspective to learn that we have inherent worth and value even while we're not on performing, doing whatever, that our friends, our family, the universe, everything is okay. And they we're still worthy and loved and it's all okay. I wish I was as good as Kevin and Kat. Um, but I just find it harder to interrupt now. So that's that. <laughs> I haven't learned to listen any better. <laughs> Doug. Uh, am I muted? No. No. <clears throat> uh, I have poor balance and being on crutches now and non-weight bearing, I'm very afraid of falling. Um, even before I fell and broke my leg, I was constantly bouncing into things and having near falls. Um, but having to use crutches every time I go outside these days, I'm not going outside all that much. Um, I know this is temporary and I'll heal, but it's ongoing fear of falling and watching the Michael J. Fox movie still. I mean, he's taken some nasty falls recently. Mm -hmm. It's not the pain of the actual fall. It's how the recovery will go that gives me anxiety. Mm. There is so much uncertainty. Sometimes I think the the trick with Parkinson's is mastering living with uncertainty, that that's sort of like the most difficult skill of all, you know, anyway. Christy. You know, I, I always use the, the, the saying, I don't fear falling. I fear the day when people won't let me fall. Hmm. But building off what Doug was saying, that I think that like having to have all the pins that the Michael J. Fox has had in his hands and it pins in his all, all of those things that he's broken, I feel like the I the anesthesia from that. I just that scares me having that having to have that much anesthesia and being in the hospital for that long. What about your meds being off? It's just uncomfortable that I would just hate to be off for that long possibly without i that just scares me um in addition to and so i'm giving a talk at my um movement specialist conference in um june and what terrifies me is that i'm just going to go off in the middle of my talk that just yeah terrifies me so that timing so sometimes i can time my meds sometimes i can't and i just that just is constant fear of going off and not being able to function. That's what prompted me to get DBS. My medicine was effective for like 59 minutes, then it was effective for 55, and then 54, and then 50, and it was like, yeah. Once I turn into the Tin Man, it's just impossible because then it's like I feel like I can't speak right because my face, just everything just feels slow. And I just can't do it. So I'm just terrified of that, but terrified of taking too much. So what if I'm moving too much? Then I have to give my seasickness warning, you know, that I'm sorry about my dyskinesia. Please look away if you get motion sick. Three. Um, I think one of my fears now is falling and uh, freezing. The freezing, I'm not sure when or how that will happen. Uh, my doctor, my neurologist says there's no indication. Last appointment that it would happen anytime soon. I don't know. You know what I mean? I wish there was like a sign. You'd get a letter in the mail that says from, you know, next week you will start freezing. But uh, no warning like that. The falling is actually more of a real concern because I definitely have balance issues now. 
And I worry that, you know, houses are not made for people with balance issues, right? Especially if you work in a kitchen or you have stuff stored up high. And if you live alone or if you live with short people, I live with short people. So we all have to get up on ladders to get things. And I'm looking at these people who've designed homes. I'm like, did you not consider that people age, whether you have Parkinson's or not, we're not going to all be able to get up on a ladder. So I am now trying to move all my stuff to the lower level so I can be on my hands and knees and crawl because that's, of course, very comfortable too. Um, <laughs> and store things. But yeah, falling is a big issue. So I really need to go back to doing Tai Chi, Argentinian, Argentine tango, whatever it is to get my balance more steady and then learn how to fall, you know, because it's going to happen and I need to learn how to fall as properly as I can, as best as I can. And I know Jimmy Choi has some videos on that and it's just mm -hmm. been something I've been putting off because it terrifies me because I was a terrible at gymnastics, but yeah, there you go. Can I just add that? Um, so I fell a few times in my like my kitchen and also in my bedroom. I fell and smashed my face into um, a book bookcase I have. There's I practice falling and boxing and stuff and uh, at the gym. And it's just there's nothing that prepared me. I'm s sorry. Don't don't mean to be Debbie Downer, but there's nothing that prepared me for that falling. It just Debbie. happened. I was what? Debbie. Yeah, I know. I was up and I was down. I don't know what even happened. I don't even know how it happened. Yeah. Next thing you know, my face was in a bookcase. Oh. I still have the hematoma from like a year ago. I can still feel oh. it. Ouch. We've only I'm got surprised. a couple. We've only got a couple minutes less. I want to get to everyone. So, Brian, you got anything there, quick for us? Um, just and I think this is probably everybody's is not having my world defined by Parkinson's so much. I don't want to get where my world gets smaller and smaller and I have to live by the MDS or just all the constraints that can happen uh, and like not traveling, you know, making that decision to not travel was painful, but it was right. I just don't want Parkinson's to define my whole world. Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. the, the biggest thing that I'm working to stave off. Mm -hmm. One thing about the falling though, I wanted to mention this gym I go to, they put a big board on wheels and they just have you stand there and then eventually they pull it out and you have to move your feet to catch yourself. Yeah, no, it's really hard, um, but it really does kind of prepare. But, it, you know, you have to do it a lot, probably because it didn't help from my last fall. But I thought that was a great practice. Amber, you want to finish us off here with the final comment? So I'm not going to talk about them. <laughs> But no, I mean, I agree with everybody, the progression, the choking, the falling. I wear two inch heels now and I feel like I'm on stilts. Um, the memory, because I look at my grandma and I think like that's going to be me. And I get, just hope you guys have fun with it when I get there. And I can't remember, you know, the name of a dog or anything and just make stuff up. And um, there, there, there's so much to be fearful of um so much that I don't know and I just try to laugh at it as much as possible because that's the only thing getting me through you were you were you were thank, uh, thank you all so much for this conversation um so many great comments and people appreciating the conversation and uh there's a lot more to talk about uh somebody did mention no one's scared about dementia or you know, i saw that uh, i think i think uh everybody is a little bit um and fortunately we're going to have a session next month we're just going to continue this move a little bit of fear into shame which i think a lot of that will relate to that Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Parkinson's Podcast. For more information about the Davis Finney Foundation and to learn about educational offerings and community events for people affected by Parkinson's, please visit davisfinneyfoundation.org or dpf.org.